Welcome to Under the Lens. Come and enjoy an extraordinary, raw, and unfiltered podcast that delivers debate, discussions, and interviews about film, pop culture, and everything in between. Here is your host, film critic and journalist, Byron Lafayette. Hey all, and welcome to Under the Lens. I am, of course, your host, Byron Lafayette. And today we have a very special episode uh, of the podcast. We're going to be talking about Christmas movies, uh, some of our favorites, uh, some of our least favorites, and what you guys should be watching this holiday season. Uh, I have uh, two uh, very special guests with me today. Uh, I have uh, Curry Morris from the uh, Curry Review. And I also have, uh, for longtime listeners of the podcast, I have uh, J.B. Huffman from Manly Movies. Uh, he's a longtime friend of the show. And I'm very happy for uh, both of these guys to join me today uh, with their top 10 lists. Uh, so uh, welcome to the program, guys. It's good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Glad to be here. Yeah. So uh, just, you know, briefly before we get started, you know, uh, what is your guys' relationship with Christmas movies? Uh, do you guys like them? Do you dislike them? Are you excited every year to uh, to watch them? How, how does that go? I mean, I don't start getting, you know, a lot of people start, start on them in like, you know, October. And I'm like, uh. <laughs> I like to wait until December, really, to get started on them. But I do enjoy them. Um, it's just, I have my favorites and sometimes I venture and watch something that's, that I haven't seen before, but I always go back to my favorites. <laughs> so. Yeah. For me, I'm, I'm very much, a, I'm going to wait until after Thanksgiving to start the Christmas uh, craze <laughs> per se, but uh, I don't rewatch Christmas movies a ton. There is probably like one or two that I rewatch fairly regularly. Or ones I've like watched so much with my parents growing up that uh, there's a special fondness there. Um, but there are go tos for sure, like anything. Um, but I'm not like a huge. I have to watch all of these Christmas movies as a tradition every year. I'm more likely to watch Lord of the Rings in December as an anniversary than I have to watch a Christmas movie. But yeah, yeah I can't criticize that. <laughs> uh. All right. Well, you know, why don't we, uh, before we get into our, our uh, top 10 lists, um, you know, why don't we uh, start with uh, with some honorable mentions of ones that uh, that we liked but didn't quite make it onto that uh, that top 10. Uh, do you uh, want to start us off, JB? Sure. Uh, well, some that I remember that I grew up on that, you know, I've always had a special fondness for, but they're not going to make my top 10 is like the Santa Claus with Tim Allen and uh, Home Alone 2, which, you know, every time I rewatch it, it's not as good as I remember it <laughs> growing up. It was, I, I used to love it when I was growing up, but it's just not, not top 10 material for me. Um, and then there's another one that came out in 1998 called I'll Be Home for Christmas with Jonathan Taylor Thomas and Jessica Biel. And, you know, in 1998, Jonathan Taylor Thomas and Jessica Biel were like it <laughs> back then, you know? So um, that was, you know, back in the uh, home improvement in seventh heaven days. But yeah, that I, I always have a special fondness for that movie, even though I know it's not that great. <laughs> Um, but then there's also, you know, the classics like the Christmas Carol, uh, whichever version you're watching of that, there's like 25 of them, um, trading places, fat man, which is not a classic, <laughs> but it's a very non-traditional Christmas movie that I really, really enjoy. And then there's a couple of rom-coms that I've watched a couple of times with my wife and, and she would probably say the holiday is probably one of her favorites. And I, 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 I can't argue with that. It's a great movie. Um, but I also would bring up uh, a movie that came out in 2019 called Last Christmas with uh, Amelia Clark and Henry Golding. 
That was a and good one. I liked that. Hmm. It really was. Yeah. Um, I know that's Byron's pick for, uh, for James Bond is Henry Golding, right? That is correct. Yes. I would <laughs> love to see him in that role. My man, Snake yeah, those... Eyes, shout out. Huh? My man, Snake Eyes. Give him a shout out. Nice. Yeah. But yeah, those would be my honorable mentions that I would you know throw out there. They didn't quite make the top 10 for me, but you know, still good ones to revisit every so often. Um, it happened on Fifth Avenue is also a good one too. So cool, you're gonna have to have to hold me back from my love of uh, of Snake Eyes. You know, just diving into making this a Snake Eyes episode. So, <laughs> but before that happens, I'll hand it over to uh, to Curry for his honorable mentions. <laughs> uh, plot twist: I'm also a big Snake Eyes movie fan. Um, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, for me, this list was hard to make because first of all. I had trouble like thinking of like Christmas movies that like, like what are some that people I know haven't watched or aren't as popular that like I love or maybe won't get as highly ranked as some other ones. Um, So of course, you know, I come up with this big list and even now I feel like I'm going to forget something and one of y'all are going to say it. I'm going to be like, I'm going to change my list. But for now, like for honorable mentions, the three that kind of come to mind and the first one is one that I feel like, is overplayed, overhyped, slightly overrated, but also when you watch it, you can't help but love it. And that is Elf with Will Ferrell. Um, that's my first honorable mention. Um, I think it's a little too overrated to put in my top 10, but also I un- completely understand why people love it, right? Like it's just one of those things that plays way too much. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, would be Santa Claus is Coming to Town, uh, the old uh, Rankin Bass uh, animation, the stop motion animation. I'm a big fan of those, but that one I don't quite as hold uh, to on a pedestal as I do with some others. And then another one, and this one really hurt to not put in my top 10, but it's just not one I find myself being able to rewatch as often. It's more, it's more one that I feel like is referenced and has a, that cultural significance. And that is a Christmas story. Um, really love it. There's actually a really funny uh, story with my dad. They did a play version of this in my local, like, uh, teen theater or whatnot and they were auctioning off a leg lamp and my dad put my name in the drawing and I was terrified I was going to win and have to go on stage and take it and also when I was a kid I looked a lot like Ralphie I had glasses very similar to his uh, so that movie's got a special place in my heart but doesn't quite crack that top 10 but that's mine those are all good choices. Uh, you know, it, honestly, like honorable mentions are almost a little bit like more painful than the list itself, just because, you know, yes. I find that there's ones that I really like that are ended up on there. So for for me, you know, it was close. You know, there was a few that were on the top 10 that like, as I thought of more had to, you know, come off. But um, uh, for me, my my honorable mentions I had were some very painful ones. Uh, but, you know, uh, Muppet Christmas Carol, um, you know, is one that I love, uh, you know, that, that was an honorable mention, uh, 1947's the Bishop's wife, uh, with Cary Grant. That's Um, a great one. Oh, it's a great movie, you know? And it was like, I almost had that in my top 10, uh, you know, then, um, uh, 1988's Die Hard, of course, uh, you know, almost made it into my top 10 because it's a movie I rewatch every year and I love it. Um, and uh, then one that is probably an unpopular Christmas movie that you would never hear on any list, but one that I still enjoy is a uh, reindeer games with uh, um, nice. Ben Affleck. It's just, it's a fun movie, nice. you know, haven't it's, seen that one since probably right after it came out. I need yeah. to rewatch that one. It's a pretty, pretty awful movie, but at the same time, like I said, there's just so much, there's so much fun stuff and the cast is so good that it's, it's just one of those ones you can have a lot of fun with. Um, so I'm, I'm probably going to end up rewatching that one this year. Um, but yeah, so those were my, my honorable mentions, uh, you know, and there's just, you know, there's so many, so many Christmas movies, even that, that didn't even make that. Um, so, uh, and oh, one one last one too that was a honorable mention too was a uh, Mickey's Christmas Carol. It was a, a thirty minute animated Very nice uh, film. I just love that one as well. Uh, it's so much fun. So, all right, well, we got our honorable mentions uh, out of the way, and uh, for those of you who are listening, we are also going to be uh, talking about our number one most disliked Christmas movie uh, after we get through our top ten. So, uh, so stay tuned for uh, for that one. 
Um, you probably haven't heard uh, haven't heard that as a uh, as a selection in a podcast about your favorite Christmas movies. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get started with the whole reason that you've been listening to this podcast, which is the uh, top ten list. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go uh, go around the uh, around the circle. We'll start with uh, with number ten, and then we'll kind of work our way up. Um, now, you know, uh, I can say for myself here that this top 10 list is not necessarily laid out in any particular order, except for the number one film. Uh, the other ones kind of are interchangeable. So, uh, you know, so when I say what my number 10 is, that doesn't necessarily mean it's my 10th least favorite on the list. Um, but uh, I can only speak for myself. That's not for for our guests today. Um, so what we'll do is why don't we get started, uh, with, uh, you Curry, we'll start with our, our number 10, then we'll go, uh, Curry, JB, and then me, and, uh, and, uh, we'll go until we hit our, uh, hit our number one. Sounds good. So I kind of hinted at this already, but at number 10, I have Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, uh, the stop motion animation one, uh, often packaged with Santa Claus is coming to town and other films of that era and that style. There's just something about this one. I remember watching it as a kid a lot. Um, the, the characters are memorable. The songs are good. It's got a heartwarming message. You know, it's just one of those timeless stories that I could see, like, you know, it's just, it's just of cultural significance. And also in my family, we have a joke that, uh, the, oh gosh, I can't remember. I think it's Hermie the dentist, uh, or no Hermie the elf who wants to be a dentist. Um, he looks a lot like my younger brother (laughs) and we actually have a a Christmas ornament and we would always hold it up to his face and take a picture. And, uh, it's just really funny. And, uh, I have a lot of good memories watching that one. That is really funny. Uh, (laughs) great choice though. Thank you. Um, for me, now this is, this is the part where I cheat a little bit. Um, I think I did this on our Thanksgiving special on my show (laughs) a couple of weeks ago. Um, But all four of these movies, if you add them all together, they're about as long as Die Hard. So um, you could say it's a cheat if you want to, but they're all short, super short specials. Um, One of them is called Happy Holidays with Bing and Frank, 1957. It's like just like a little special with uh, Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra and they just sit around the uh, the table and sing like classic Christmas songs and they you know kind of cut up and stuff it's it's just a cool a cool thing to sit down and watch and if you and if you like creating music like that it's it was it's, it's for you for sure um, another one I can't I can't have a list and not put Charlie Brown Christmas on there I just I can't do it so you know that's my other short to make up one long movie. <laughs> um, and then there is Christmas Eve on Sesame street from 1978, which is one that I grew up watching every year, multiple times. And now I watch it as an adult and I swear <laughs> I cry watching freaking Sesame street when I watch it again. Um, but I, I, not a year goes by that. I don't watch that one. That one actually is an hour long. It's 60 minutes. But it's just, it's a really cool story. Um, but yeah, check it out if you haven't seen it. I'm not going to give any spoilers away. Uh, and then I had to include, no, not the Ron Howard remake. No, not the Benedict Cumberbatch Illumination remake. The original 1966, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Because that's the only one anybody should watch. I'm kidding. I'm. I don't want to. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But <laughs> I like the I original. I, I like. I like Boris Karloff. I mean, it's, it's Frankenstein's monster, right? Doing the. Doing the <laughs> <laughs> that's what makes it so great. It's Boris Karloff's voice narrating and playing the Grinch and everything. Um, and then, of course, that classic song "You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch" is just so perfect. Um, yeah, my kid actually sang in a choir special tonight at the the town hall tree lighting contest or t- the tree lighting service and they sang several songs and this that was one of the ones that they sang and i was like yes i'm so happy that they picked that song <laughs> that's awesome oh. yeah man well uh my my 10th uh my 10th film here um you know i was putting them a little bit into into a little bit semblance of order here uh, I think uh, number ten for me uh, is going to be 
1996 film with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sinbad, uh, Jingle All the Way. Um, nice. You know, it's, 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 it's just so much fun. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those movies, you know, you see, you don't really see on that many lists, but you hear a little, a lot of people talk about, it. I loved it as a kid when I saw it, you know, I've seen it like countless times and it's one of those ones I revisit a lot. It's just, it's hilarious. You know, it's just, it's, it's really one of those, it, it has almost that feel of like the, almost like a 1930s slapstick comedy almost, um, you know, because it's ridiculous, you know, uh, it's not really meant to make a lot of sense at all. You know, it's, it's kind of almost like a surreal, you know, like a surreal world almost. It's not really a realistic world, but, um, but I, it's just so much fun. Uh, so my, my family and I always rewatch that, um, you know, normally every other year and, and we have a lot of fun, uh, laughing together. So, so that, that goes with my, uh, my number 10, um, so now moving on to uh, to number nine, uh, what do you have in that uh, in that spot, uh, Curry? First of all, everything you just said made me so happy. Uh, <laughs> second of all, if I knew that we could cheat and put shorts in one spot, this list would have been a lot easier. <laughs> 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 because several well, minor shorts coming up, but we will get there when we get there. Uh, I'm, number- I'm out of Brooks and Rules. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> I am actually kind of jealous. I didn't think of that because it's whatever. Um, at number nine, uh, I have the Santa Claus with Tim Allen. Um, this is one. I know I watched it all of them a ton as a kid. Um, but I haven't rewatched it in a long time. And I, I, I plan to rewatch the trilogy since the new Disney plus show is out. Um, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But I just remember there was something about it as a kid, just the way they did the Santa Claus lore and the comedy and just loving Tim Allen so much as a kid from Home Improvement, Galaxy Quest, all of those things. You would never think that Tim Allen, you know, Buzz Lightyear would be a good Santa Claus. And yet, like, he's probably one of the best, if not the best movie Santa Clauses we've ever had. And uh, I just have a huge soft spot for it. It's like that peak 90s um just movie magic, I guess you could say a very original, very fresh compared to a lot of Christmas movies. So I, I really enjoy that one. So the Santa Claus is my number nine. Nice. That's yeah, a that, good choice <laughs> for sure. That that's actually one of my wife's all time favorites and it just barely didn't make my top 10. Yeah. I hear you. Um, all right. So my number nine, this is where I go a different direction here. I've got to put Batman returns in here, man. You know, I was wondering if that was going to show up on somebody. Interesting choice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause I just, I love these uh, Tim Burton Batman movies. It's just such a, um, I just love the take on it and it's very, very comic driven and it's how I would imagine Gotham to be. And I, I just love every time I watch this now as an adult, I'm like, man, this really is a Christmas movie. <laughs> like, um, it really is though. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But yeah, I, I, it's one that I could, I don't necessarily throw it on at Christmas time, but I will, you know, just randomly go through the, those four nineties Batman movies in, around Christmas time <laughs> or after Christmas, or I think last year I watched them all in like the beginning of January. So I can kind of um, still feel like it's Christmas. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I'm a big Tim Burton fan and I, I love the, the Michael Keaton Batman movies. Um, but yeah, you know, Danny DeVito is the penguin and Michelle Pfeiffer is Catwoman. Like it just, it doesn't get much better than that, man. It's, it's, they're so cheesy, but they're also so good and just so <laughs> nostalgic at the same time. You know, it's funny. I, I rewatched Batman Returns not that long ago and it used to be my favorite one. But then this time when I rewatched it and uh, Byron, you can cut this out if you want to. It, it, is, it is, everything in it is such an innu- innuendo, like every single line. <laughs> I was like, this is like so hard to even take seriously. And it like it got to the point where I was like, okay, this is getting old. But on that note, isn't Batman and Robin also set at Christmas? That is a- because I remember a part where uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze is making his uh, like henchmen sing a Christmas song about it being cold. Yeah, I what? That's a, it, I think it might be. I think you might. I, 
I'm going to have to revisit that and see. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Yeah. And lastly, I totally told my wife I was going to cheat and do this, but I decided not to. But I'm going to throw out another honorable mention since we're on the subject. Yeah. Iron Man 3 is a Christmas movie. It 100% is. It is. It is, it is definitely and a Christmas movie. I almost I almost put it on my list. And by, by rating alone, it should be on this list. Yeah. But we'll just ignore that for now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. We'll talk uh, about it again later. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. spoiler alert man well coming in at my at my number nine it's probably going to be a, a bit of a controversial one for some people um but it is a newer film uh from uh from 2020 and it is uh fat man with uh mill gibson yes, yes. You know, i need to see that one. Oh, it is Dude. it is the weirdest movie because like the trailer almost showcases it as this comedy, but it's like a thriller, a drama. It's a moral like lesson. It's such a strange movie, but uh, uh, Mel Gibson is just fantastic in it as as uh, Santa Claus is kind of almost like Last Jedi depressed Luke Skywalker version of Santa. You know, he's withdrawn himself from the world. He's not really into it anymore. Um, you know, and then, you know, this, you this liked it? Oh, I, <laughs> I loved this film. Yes. It was, I, I loved the idea of this kind of like, you know, uh, of, I loved the idea that it, that it, it, um, that it presented as like Santa, not just being this, this guy who delivers presents, but he's also kind of an enforcer of the world's morals a little bit. I kind of liked that, you know, that he, um, you know, they, they kind of impress almost this kind of like Judeo Christian, you know, like god you know um role on him almost and it's just full of a lot of ridiculous you know like gunfights and <laughs> there's like this one scene where he's he's confronting the villain and he picks up this glass of milk and he drinks the milk down and then he like grimaces and he's like oh he's like yeah i taste fentanyl he's like that'll do it to you <laughs> and then he just goes on with the scene <laughs> Oh, oh it, it's just a movie you have to see to believe, but I really, I really do love it. And so it, it made it to my ninth, uh, my ninth spot. Oh, Curry, this movie would be right up your alley. I promise you. It's so, it's so good. Well, it's um, Mel Gibson, so that's an easy sell. So <laughs> Exactly. And that's, that's probably why he's, why, why Byron said it would be controversial because, you know, you said the name Mel Gibson and oh my gosh, people would <laughs> lose their freaking minds. <laughs> that aside, I love his movies. Like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. I love his yeah. movie. I love his as an actor, director, whatever. I just... oh. Braveheart's in my top 10 of all time, and I love all of his other movies. <laughs> and uh, JB and I gushed over him in Expendables 3 in one of the Manly Movie uh, episodes, which oh, hasn't yeah. been released yet, right? Has not released yet. I'm going to put it out a little bit before the, the new movie comes out, whenever that may be. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know, right? <sighs> I, yeah, I feel, I feel like Mel Gibson is one of those few kind of actor directors, almost like Clint Eastwood, that he excels at both. You know, you don't see yeah, that yeah. a huge amount with, uh, with yeah, talent. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. Well, cool. So uh, we're moving on to number eight. Yep. Let's, let's hit number eight. <laughs> All right. Well, this one was mentioned earlier in an honorable mention. And I put it up there because of my uh, fondness of it as a kid, for it as a kid. And <laughs> I've heard from a lot of folks that whenever they rewatch this, that it's not as good as they remember. So I'm a little scared to rewatch it. But that is Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. When I was a kid, this was actually my favorite of the Home Alone movies, uh, which really there are only two of. We don't speak of the ones afterwards. <laughs> but, what are you talking uh, about? There's only two. Exactly. I never even knew they made more. (laughs) What are we talking about again? Uh, So anyways, we'll come back to that when we talk about most hated Christmas movies. Um, (laughs) uh, So Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Whatever problems people have with it, I just think it's hilarious. I'm a big slapstick comedy fan. So just, uh, you know, when Kevin is just beating up on Marvin them and like the bricks and I think it's the bricks in that one. I get them confused sometimes. Um, all the, just the crazy things that happen and, uh, I'm a middle child. So like Kevin being forgotten or being put on the wrong plane, I always like <laughs> felt seen. <when> I was <laughs> uh, not that that ever happened to me, of course, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just the little things that your mind does to, like connect you with characters. And of course, you know, home alone just has a way of capturing my heart because of that iconic theme uh, that plays, uh, that music is just whenever I hear it, it just warms my heart. So I think it's funny. I think it's clever. Uh, it may not be as good as the first one, but it's still very good in my opinion. 
Oh yeah, I mean it's a good movie. It's it's top twenty for me. Nice. Um, I, I I I enjoy it, and I always watch it. I mean, I'm gonna watch the first one, and I'm going to watch the second one right after every single year. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 a great one. It's you know it's uh, I always say it's one of those sequels that does you know almost everything right in the sense it ups it ups the stakes. It you know it gets bigger. You know brings in more characters, but. Um, you know, even though the the first one I think will always be my favorite and the classic, there's just so much to love in that second one. There's there's so much it has so much heart. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, the Plaza Hotel, right? The, the Tim Curry. Honestly, people the, I saw a meme that said you can tell a lot about a person by um what the first movie you saw Tim Curry in. And <laughs> for me, it's Home Alone 2 every single time. That's that's yeah. the one that I think of. I, I mean that's that's the role that I will always think of. I mean, I know he's done some great movies and he's had some crazy roles, but man, that <laughs> that hotel manager is always going to be the one that I think of. I love it. Nice. Um, with me, I want to stay with the Tim Burton theme on this one, and I'm going to go with one that was written by Tim Burton but not directed. 1993 is mm. The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um. And, and you can kind of go back and forth whether this is a Christmas movie or a Halloween movie. And it kind of takes place, you know, in, in both worlds, I guess. But it, it's one that I, the first time I watched it, I, I liked it, but I wouldn't have put it like, you know, among my favorites. And then, you know, when I watched it again, I liked it a little bit more. And then when I watched it with my son recently, back um, during Halloween, actually, we, we sat down and watched it and he just ate it up and he always, and he's four, right? So he's, he, he can't really say it. He just calls it Jack Skellington. And, but, but he says it like Jack that again. Like he, <laughs> it's so cute the way he says it. <laughs> That's awesome. He always wants to watch it now, but he just loved it so much. And I'm sorry when a four year old can sit down and watch a stop motion claymation movie from the 1990s. Like that's a win as a dad, right? <laughs> like, yeah, for sure. So, because you know that nowadays they have to be glued to all that crazy CGI now. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's a cool story. It's very interesting and dark. Um, and parents can watch it and kids can watch it and get some, everybody can get something out of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good one. I, I really enjoy it. And Danny Elfman actually, uh, does voice work in the movie, which is really cool. I mean, he's, he's normally a composer, but of course he composed the movie, but he also did Jack Skellington's voice and he did several other voices. And then you got Catherine O'Hara playing Sally, um, which Catherine O'Hara is a staple for Christmas movies, right? You, you've got to have her. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, don't sorry. hurt me but i've never seen it oh oh you're hurting my heart man oh, i no. actually saw it for the first time uh, uh this uh, it was last year was the first time i saw it and it was uh um they put it on at um at my office of when i was working and um and yeah it, it was definitely like you know I, I would say it's it's not really you know something that's like my cup of tea necessarily but i did appreciate uh you know, just the, you know, the, the stop motion, the music, you know, it was extremely well done. Uh, you know, so, so definitely I tip my hat to it for, for all of that. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. So, uh, yeah, we're talking about our, our eighth, right. Our yes. eighth, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. I yes, lost track there for a second. So my uh, my number eight pick uh, is going to be from 1951 and it is a, a Christmas Carol. And um, this is the version that stars uh, Alistair Sim, uh, and it is directed by Brian Desmond Hurst. And um, I believe this is a a British uh, a British uh, adaptation, I believe. Um, and uh, you know, there's so many different versions of, of a Christmas Carol, but this is the the first one that I was ever introduced uh, to as a kid. And, um, you know, I just, I just love it. Uh, the way it's, it's filmed, it's so moody. Uh, it's almost filmed like a noir almost, uh, you know, with the, with the shadows, the close up camera, um, camera shots, uh, 
you know, the acting, everything. It's just, it, it's a great movie. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's one that I revisit all the time, uh, just cause not only the nostalgia of me, you know, as a kid, but just like, it really handles all of the themes of a Christmas Carol really, really well. Nice. Good I, actually, I don't think I've seen that version. I've seen the, the 1933 with, uh, Reginald Owen. And I might've seen that one back. I just, I can't remember if I have or not, but I don't know what versions I've seen and what I haven't. There's so many of them. <laughs> right. There and then really there's, is. you know, there's the Jim Carrey version and then the Disney uh, Patrick version. Stewart version, Patrick Stewart, <laughs> M- M- the Muppets and the Mickey Mouse. Like it's just, Oh my gosh. There's so yeah. many of them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh man. All right. Well, as we, uh, as we move along here, we're now moving on to our, uh, our, our seventh pick. Uh, what do you have uh, for us, Curry? Yeah. So at number seven, this might be kind of a, kind of a deep pull. Uh, neither of you guys have it logged on litter box. Um, but it is called uh, the snowman from 1982 directed by Jimmy T Murakami and Diane Jackson. And I actually didn't know this before, but David Bowie is one of the voices. Um, there's not much in the way of voices in this. This is actually a short film. It's only 28 minutes. Um, this was one that my mom loves and we had a VHS tape version of it. And then I think we got a DVD later on and we watched it every year. I can't even tell you how many times I've watched it. I don't even know if there is any lines of dialogue, maybe one, or there's some grunts or something like that, but it's about, it's essentially the story of this boy and he builds a snowman and the snowman comes to life and he takes him on this adventure. And that's really all you need to know. Um, it is beautiful. It is haunting. It is heartbreaking, but it is also hopeful and it has a score the, the main theme that will just stay with you and stick with you and make you reflect upon Christmas, I think, in ways you haven't. The music does that for me. So I, I highly recommend if you two have not seen it. It's only 28 minutes, and that's, I think, with credits. Uh, definitely check it out. It's called The Snowman from 1982. Um, I think it's very uh, underrated. Um, but it looks like people who have seen it do agree with me on Letterboxd. It has a average rating of 3.9 uh, out of 5, so... I, I definitely recommend yeah, it. Yeah, um, I haven't seen that either. I haven't even heard of it, but it looks like a lot of people that, you know, on my letterbox really, really like it. Yeah, it's good. Um, and I see that it's it's streaming on Amazon Prime, and if you don't have that, it is on Vudu Free with ads. So oh, perfect. anybody wants to watch it can watch it for free. <laughs> Y'all should uh, check it out and let me know what you think. I'd be curious as to your thoughts. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check it out. Like, um, I, I want to say I haven't heard of it. That being said, I recognize the artwork, so I feel like I've probably seen some clips of it maybe in like mm-hmm. montages mm-hmm. or something. Um, but yeah, definitely going to be adding that to my list for this year to watch. Cool. Interesting. There's also a movie called The Snowman with Michael Fassbender and Val Kilmer and J.K. Simmons. I was like, I've never heard of this movie. What the heck? <laughs> From 2017. <laughs> Holy mackerel. And right. actually, I just found out there's a sequel to what I just talked about that I did not know about that was made in 2012. Oh, wow. Nice. Okay. Okay. There's a Why legacy not? sequel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love go. the related films tab on Letterboxd they added. Because I'm like, oh, I didn't know there was another one. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, I, I like that a lot. Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm going, I'm going back classic now with the original Miracle on 34th Street, 1947. Nice. Um, I know Byron prefers the new one with Mara Wilson, but man, I just I can't. Natalie Wood and the you know, Maureen O'Hara. Uh, it, Edmund Gwynn playing Chris Kringle is just so it just it hits me in the feels man I can't I can't not like it's this is the one that I always go back to I do like the 90s one but it doesn't touch the original to me and and I'm a big as I've said before I'm just a really big fan of anything made in the 40s it's just I don't know. I don't know what it is about that decade, but it, it just it hits me and it hits my soul for some reason. So nice. That is a great choice. It's it's a really it's a really good movie, and it's kind of funny too that you mentioned that one because uh, my seventh choice here is actually Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, uh, but the one from the nineties. So, nice. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. We kind nice. of had a had a pairing there. Um, 
Yeah, you know, um, you know, well, I do really enjoy the '40s ones because I'm a huge fan of the the golden age of of Hollywood. Uh, I just I love the uh, 1994 uh, version of that. Um, you know, uh, it just uh, you know I was introduced to it. You know, when I was when I was a kid, um, I saw it first before I saw the uh, the '40s version. Um, and it's just like, oh man, what a cast! You know, we have Elizabeth Perkins, we have J.T. Walsh, you know, we have James Remar, Dylan McDermott, Richard Attenborough as Chris Kringle, Mara Wilson, uh, you know, and the list goes on. There's just like it's a who's who of '90s talent, you know, uh, um, in this film, and uh, you know, uh, it has you know large set pieces, um, you know, a huge amount of heart just overflowing with it, and. Um, you know, just for me, honestly, you know, the, the, the iconic and just the, the definitive, you know, Santa Claus for me will always be Richard Attenborough, uh, just the way he, he portrays it. Um, I just absolutely adore that movie. It's one I watch, uh, with my parents normally every year. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's definitely one that, uh, I know I stand kind of by myself a little bit with preferring it to the, uh, to the, um, the original, but, uh, but I just, I just love it. Oh, it's fine. It's a fine film. I mean, it's 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 a good remake, and like you said, it's got a who's who of nineteen nineties cast. And I mean, I grew up on on some Mary Wilson, man. I mean, Mrs. Doubtfire is one of my all time favorites. And then you know, there's Matilda, which mm-hmm. like <laughs> I used to watch a lot growing up. So yeah, I'm I'm a fan of that cast and 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 the and Mara Wilson back in the day. So. Mm-hmm. No, that, that is true. Yeah. You know, so definitely people who listen, you know, I, I would definitely recommend, you know, see, see both versions of it because, uh, because, um, the nineties one is not a straight remake. It actually does change the story around a bit, you mm-hmm. know, so there's, it's, it's, it's very different. So like, you know, it's not like you're watching the same movie when you see, you know, one after the other, uh, they both are very different. So, so I always recommend people, you know, see both of them because there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of little cool extra stuff in there. Which is how it should be. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh-huh. <laughs> if you're going to make your remake, please don't just do shot for shot. Like, <laughs> change something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Switch it up a little bit. Uh. <laughs> Man. Otherwise, what's the point? We'll just watch the original. <laughs> exactly. It needs to bring something new to the table. Um, mm-hmm. You know, <coughs> Lion King 2016. Oh, God. Uh- <laughs> Oh, man. Don't get and I like and I yeah. like John Favreau too. I'm a big fan of John Favreau, but man, that is just one one that I can't deal with that movie. No, yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's the thing. Whenever I criticize the Disney remakes, it normally has nothing to do with the quality, has nothing to do with the talent or the directing. It's just that I do have a problem with shot for shot remakes. I, I like to have a have a little bit of a of um you know uh, differences there. So, mm-hmm. man, well, rolling around to our number six uh we're gonna be leading off here with a uh, curry so uh what's what's your uh, what's your choice for that slot <clears throat> yeah uh remembering my mother again this is her you know it's between this and the mummy as her all-time favorite movies she watches these movies multiple times a year uh always has growing up to the point where we hated this one growing up but <laughs> honestly when i think about it it's iconic and I need to rewatch it. I watched part of it last year with her uh, because I can't even really tell you the full plot of the movie. But now, the I'm going to be really disappointed if you don't say the mummy now. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> it's, it's not the mummy is a Christmas movie, but no, that is a white Christmas. Uh, white uh-huh. Christmas is just one of those magical uh, Christmas movies, man. And, uh, I was thinking, I was like, did it come out in the 40s? No, it came out in 54. So I wasn't sure if it was mm-hmm. in, in that uh, era that JB was talking about, but it's close enough. Uh, you know, just that, just the main song, right? The fact that from Holiday Inn, it got its own movie because it's so iconic, <laughs> right? You know, and I, I actually don't know if I've ever seen Holiday Inn the whole way through, but just, I love being Crosby too. Um, the, the film is funny. It's, it's heartwarming. It's beautifully shot. Uh, and again, just that music. I mean, anytime I hear that song, like there's a quintessential, like secular Christmas song, it's going to be that one. Like mm-hmm. you know, pe- people dream of a white Christmas. Like what other thing can you imagine than, you know, as a kid waking up to snow on Christmas, I don't have a lot of like detailed analysis thoughts to say about it, but it's just one of those 
magical Christmas movies that is going to be iconic forever. Oh yeah. I 100% agree with you. Yep. Man, yep. we'll talk about it again later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, <laughs> it will be coming around again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so since you mentioned the, it's funny that you mentioned the Lion King um, and John Favreau, because my number six is John Favreau's 2003 hit elf, which has already been mentioned. Um, nice. I, I great movie, you know, people, and a lot of people will trash Will Ferrell and, I, and you know, they, they're just wrong. I get, and that's fine. People can be <laughs> wrong. Um, but man, I, I, I love his comedy. I, he's just so, and, and, and I just, I grew up watching him on Saturday night live too. So it, there's a kind of a nostalgia factor going on there, but man, this movie just, just hits me every time I watch it. You know, I, you know, I watched it growing up. I said growing up, I was like so, what, 17 when it came out, 2003. Yeah. So I was a junior in high school, but I mean, it's just such a special movie and I can't, that's one that I watch, if not every year, about every other year. Um, I always try to make an effort to watch it because I, I love the the scene with him and Zoe Deschanel singing "Baby It's Cold Outside" while she's in the shower, and he's just sitting out there like singing with her, and she doesn't know that he's there. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> oh, it's so great. Yeah. And then finally, he like sings really loud, and she realizes he's there. It's just, ah, oh, I love it, love it. It's just iconic to me, and it just makes. And then you know, Ed Asner playing Santa Claus is just funny in and of itself. And then you you got Bob Newhart as uh, Papa Elf, and then you know the the late great James Caan, who just passed away earlier this year. Um, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, great cast, um, very funny movie, and it's just like finding your inner child when you watch it. It just makes me feel like I'm twelve years old again <laughs> when I watch it. I completely forgot that John Favreau directed that. Yep. Wild. I had forgotten that too. And it was funny because I actually uh, had not seen uh, Elf when it came out. It was, uh, it was uh, actually my next door neighbors at the time who, uh, who introduced me to it that uh, me and my family were over for dinner in like a December. It was years ago. And they, and their kids were like, let's watch Elf. Let's watch Elf. And they were like, Oh, have you ever seen it? And I was like, Oh no, whatever. And I thought, Oh man, it's going to be a kid's movie. I won't like it, whatever. But I, I ended up really enjoying it. It was, it was a great movie, uh, you know? Um, and uh, it's one that I, I definitely, I need to revisit. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's I go back and forth with what my favorite John Favreau movie is, and that's that's always one of them. You know that and Chef. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chef is a great one. Too. And then, oh, of course, mm -hmm. the, the first Iron Man. I mean, yeah. gosh, <laughs> that'd probably oh. be mine. But. <laughs> Man, that's true. Well, let's see. Coming in uh, for my number six uh, is going to be kind of a, a bit of a, a dark horse. Uh, it's one that I don't see on almost any Christmas list, which is kind of kind of weird. Uh, but it's going to be 1934's The Thin Man. Uh, it's a uh, noir uh, murder mystery. Uh, um, it stars uh, William Powell, uh, Myrna Loy, Marino Sullivan. Uh, it even has some appearances by uh, such mainstays like Cesar Romero, Porter Hall. Um, just as a fantastic cast. Uh, Joker. Yes, uh -huh, exactly. Yeah, and he's <laughs> Dude, so young in it. Um, I love the Thin Man movies. I watch them with my dad all the time. I completely forgot the first ones at Christmas. Uh huh. Yeah, it's like yeah, it was the same because like yeah, my my mom. My actually, list. <laughs> yeah, my my mom was you know uh, said like hey let's watch through the Thin Man movies because uh, you know I've seen them tons of times. But I was like yeah let's let's start doing it and you know and it was a few days ago that I suddenly was like wait this is a Christmas movie. It's it's you know there's tons of Christmas references, decorations. You see it all through the movie. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, if anybody listening has not seen it, do yourself a favor and, and start watching those movies that it's, it's absolutely hilarious. Uh, so good. 
you know, um, I would say, you know, William Powell and Myrna Loy as Nick and Nora is probably one of Hollywood's great on-screen couples. Um, mm -hmm. Just absolutely electric chemistry, uh, yeah. uh, you know, um, just absolutely incredible. So, so definitely check that out if you if you haven't seen it, <laughs> and and that just warms my heart so much, Curry, that that, that you love those movies. <laughs> uh, that, that was one that my dad he absolutely adores, and I bought him like a DVD collection like a mm -hmm. decade ago which is now out of print and goes through like insane prices. Oh, wow. Uh, there's individual Blu-rays that are really expensive of those two. So I'm really hoping, <laughs> I don't know if it would happen. I would love for Criterion Collection oh, to release a oh, box man. set of them, remaster oh. in 4K, because I think my wife would really love them. She loves old movies. And mm -hmm. the writing and like the witty banter in those films, it's so fast. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost hard to keep up with it. It's, it's like so intelligently written. So yes, I'm very angry i didn't remember that but that is a great pick byron oh thank you <laughs> yeah i actually um i've only seen the first one i haven't seen the other ones because i can't I, um I, I don't know i i usually find that they're streaming like right when they're about to go off <laughs> and then i'm like <laughs> okay i can't watch all five of these movies <laughs> <laughs> all good honestly uh, yeah i want to say i believe I believe they're all streaming. Right, I believe all of them except for the fourth one are streaming on HBO Max right now. I want to say, mm. um, and the second one is, is. I mean, they're all good, but the second one is actually really good and actually has a very young Jimmy Stewart in it too. Oh, oh gosh, you that. sold me on that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We're gonna have to do another episode, guys. What is your new top ten Christmas? Movie? <laughs> <laughs> the encore. <laughs> yeah. I'm all about some Jimmy Stewart, man. Yeah, I love him too. Oh, I think yeah. we'll talk about him later, won't we? Yeah, uh, we will. <laughs> we're <laughs> going to come around. We're going to come back around to him, definitely. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, you know, um, moving on to the uh, middle of the list here that we're at at number five. Uh, what do you got for us, Curry? You know, I think I'm going to keep this one short because somebody had to have it on their list. <laughs> because <laughs> if you don't on an episode like this, are you even doing this right? And that is Die Hard. Oh, I'm so ha happy that you have it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Because you know just as a movie in and of itself i mean it's like a perfect action movie right like it's mm -hmm. it, it's close as you can get um i don't i may not have it at five stars i'm not 100 percent sure but i may bump it up because great villain great setup uh great hero so quotable and yes. so quotable in the sense and how it ties to christmas too in the setting and how they speak in the in like the plot and uh you know it's Anyone who says it's not a Christmas movie obviously is wrong. Yes. And they, need to, they need to rewatch it and see why people consider it. Cause even over the credits, I think they play like a really famous Christmas song. I can't remember which one, um, but Die Hard is phenomenal. It is a Christmas movie and it is my number five for that reason. I almost put it at number one just out of spite, but I thought that might be like too much. So. <laughs> it's not too much. I promise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It is. A, it is absolutely a Christmas movie, yeah. and it is one of my favorites. This <laughs> is, you know, uh, that it's the joke, but it's it's absolutely true. You know, it's not Christmas time till Hans has fallen off of Nakatomi Plaza. <laughs> right on. And you know what I always say to people that say it's not a Christmas movie, mm -hmm. I say, okay, um, Die Hard is essentially Home Alone in an office building, and with more <laughs> Christmas references than Home Alone. <laughs> Absolutely, like it's actually the, true. It really is. Like mm -hmm. there, there are way more Christmas references in in um, Die Hard than there are in Home Alone. Like, period. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, if you, anybody who says it's not hasn't seen it in a while, probably because <laughs> I was one of those people until I rewatched it. I was like, holy crap, this is a Christmas movie. Same, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so. Speaking of Home Alone in a Christmas in an office building, <laughs> um, Home Alone is my number five. I it's one that I watch every year. I have to. Um, Chris Columbus speaks to my heart with those two movies plus Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, in just want to, it just reminds me of of when I was a kid, and I was five years old when this movie came out. And, and yes, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if I, I don't know if I saw it in theaters, but I'm pretty sure we rented it at the local video store. For those of you who don't know, we used to have those back in the day. I miss them so much. 
<laughs> for real, right? I miss that. Oh, oh gosh, man, mm-hmm. so much. Um, but yeah, and I remember, like, it, it's just all the traps that he does and defending his house, this eight year old kid and me watching it and I'm five, you know, and I just think it's so cool to see this kid just, uh, being a, being a hero like that for his family and for his house and, and going up against the big, bad Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern, (laughs) bad guys, the wet bandits. Uh, it's just, such a great movie and uh, it's one that i always come back to uh it's, a, it's an excellent choice and definitely I, I i will be coming back to that very soon so my uh my number five uh comes around to one we've actually already talked about a little bit and that's 1954's white christmas um you know it's 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 an iconic classic christmas film for a reason um you know, uh, the, the music, the acting, just the set pieces, everything about it is amazing. Um, you know, uh, I, I can't remember when I was first introduced to it. I was very, very young. Um, I didn't appreciate it as much when I was a little, cause I didn't really like musicals all that much. Um, but, uh, I've really just, just come to absolutely adore, you know, this, this movie just with its cast, you know, Bing Crosby, Danny Kay, you know, they're just, they're so good. Um, and uh, also, I got I got to throw a shout out to this movie. And this is going to be probably one of the most niche, bizarre, uh, you know, film uh, film call outs is that, you know, it's one of those movies that has those um, those uh, um, soundstage sets that you always saw in the uh, like 40s and 50s movies. And, and it normally was in musicals. And that was almost kind of like the palm tree beach with the water. And it was like, you could totally tell it was a soundstage, totally fake that people were always dancing in front of. And there's one of those in White Christmas as there is in almost every musical. And I just, I just had to bring up that very bizarre (laughs) call out there. (laughs) Well, I'm glad that you repented of your old ways and you like musicals now. (laughs) You didn't like musicals? What? I did not like them growing up. I really, really disliked them. And, and I don't know what it is, but like over the last five to six years or so, I've really come to enjoy them. It's like, you know, uh, white Christmas, I always liked, but you know, but I, I kind of started watching them, you know, with like greatest showman, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, like a bunch of other ones. And I, and I, you know, um, my mom, uh, last year introduced me to uh, South Pacific, which I just absolutely adored. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's, there's, there's a lot of great ones out there and I'm going to be probably yeah. watching this month, La La Land, which I haven't seen yet. Oh um, man. And so the fifties was a golden age for oh, musicals man. though. Like it was all the iconic ones are from the fifties, fifties and sixties yeah. really. Um, that's when they just really started booming, but yeah. Speaking great pick. The 50s, great pick. One, one set at Christmas time. This isn't on my list. Uh, it's it, well, Christmas happens in the movie, but I don't think it's a Christmas movie. But Brian, we're in a recommendation: Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Mm. One I've of always my, heard of it, and I have not seen that one yet. That's probably like a top five musical for me. I love it so much. It's just hilarious, and if you have brothers or siblings, it will make you laugh even harder. Nice. Oh, I will definitely check that one out. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, at number four. Uh, since I can't cheat and put this with other shorts because I didn't think of that because <laughs> JB's a genius. Uh, it's, yeah, we've already talked about it a little bit, but that's uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, of all the Charlie Brown specials, this one has always been my favorite. And my wife has actually never seen them. So we've been watching them on the holidays this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so we watched, you know, Great Pumpkin. We watched the Thanksgiving one. And like she, what she keeps saying is that she's like, they're good. They're cute but they're missing like the, the hit you in the heart moment that I thought they were going to have. And I'm like, Oh, you just wait till we watch. Just wait. Night. Yeah. Yeah. This one, it's, it's just so good. You know, it's iconic with the tree and everything, but one of the things I appreciate about it, appreciate about it most is what a do direct um, proclamation of the gospel that it has. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, talking about the birth of Jesus and for that to be in a mainstream uh, animation even at, even back then i think it's just incredible and how relevant it is still in today's culture um i just i really appreciate that i remember that moving me as a child and it moves me even more as an adult with that with the understanding i have now 
And uh, it's just fantastic and easily the best of the holiday specials for Charlie Brown, in my opinion. Um, and it's it's one that is one I could probably and I think I probably have rewatched most years, except for the last couple, notwithstanding. Um, but yeah, Charlie Brown Christmas is incredible. Yeah, the 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 great thing about these you know twenty five minute shorts is they're really easy to rewatch. <laughs> you know, yes, just, they are. <laughs> I mean, if you if you want to watch them every year, it's not that hard. <laughs> you know, like, make it easy when you need to get a login for Letterbox or something. <laughs> ex- oh, exactly for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Instead of watching that extra episode of Stranger Things, watch uh, <laughs> Charlie Brown's Christmas. Or watch forty eight shorts that uh, somebody tells you about in a group. That was you, JB. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that that short film collection or whatever. Oh yeah, that was great. I logged all of them. <laughs> it's like an hour and a half worth of shorts, <laughs> and and a lot of them are one and two minutes long. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to be able to finish this challenge unless I do this, so I made myself watch it. <laughs> nice. I absolutely love how you were meant. How- <laughs> How you put together Charlie Brown Christmas and Stranger Things. I just am laughing to myself. This is great. That is great. Uh, yeah. I, that's actually a long show. I probably should have said something like, you know, home improvement or something. <laughs> so, in an episode of Stranger Things now, you could watch like 15 Charlie Browns. That's true. Yeah. You could watch every Charlie Brown special in less time than one episode of Stranger Things. That's wild. Uh, anyway, um, I guess it's my turn to go with my number four and it's already been mentioned once, but I'm going to say it again. Iron Man three is up there. Like I just, I, and you know, I, um, it's so good. It's so, it's so dang good, man. And, and I've actually, I've seen it probably more times than any other mcu movie because i want to watch it at christmas and i don't i don't need any kind of context for it like i don't have to watch the first two i can just throw it on because it's a christmas movie i don't care what anybody says it is um i mean i'll I'll say that the first one is always going to be my favorite but this is just such a really there's a lot of themes in this movie that actually connect with Christmas time. Um, you know, he's having a, um, he's got PTSD and it's like, he's dealing with a lot of internal issues and, you know, a lot of, a lot of us do at Christmas time, you know, a lot, a lot of people have, you know, they might've lost loved ones around Christmas time and, and it's sadness for a lot of people. And, and we need to be with family um, to get us back into reality and him coming to terms with, um, with his family, with, with Pepper and having to, um, you know, be there. Uh, anyway, if you haven't seen this movie, I don't want to sit here and spoil the movie, even though you, if you haven't seen it, then where have you been? This is like <laughs> MCU. Uh, it, this is just MCU's world and we're all living in it at this point. Um, so yeah, two things, on, two things on that. One, it's wild to me that this movie will be ten years old next year. Oh man! Uh-huh. Se- and secondly, why did they not release this in December? <laughs> I know it made a ton of money in May or whenever it was, but like, I think it would have been a great, obviously December like release and made even more money. But anyway. Yeah. You know, honestly, I wondered that as well, because I think like, you know, especially with like the legs that December movies have, like, I feel like it probably would have made even more money than it did, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, because it would have been fantastic. And, you know, I, I did not like Iron Man 3 when it first came out. I've warmed to it a lot over the years, Um, you know, um, and I actually do enjoy it. And I feel like also, too, I, I, I kind of retroactively like it a lot more now that um song chi has released yeah um, same. you know same. it kind of in my opinion i think it kind of makes makes iron man 3 a better a better movie uh you know kind of just expanding that whole world you know the mandarin and everything but uh um but yeah i i, I like iron man 3 and also too i will say too that the trailer for iron man 3 is pretty probably the mcu's best trailer and one of comic book movies best trailers it is so oh, good yeah. if any of you have not seen that trailer go see that trailer it's incredible I'm sure i have it's just been forever mm-hmm. yeah it's 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 amazing oh man 
Um, all right. So my, uh, my fourth, uh, one here, uh, is one that we've already talked about and that is uh, home alone. Um, you know, the, uh, mm. the first one, uh, you know, there's not a lot I can say that hasn't already been said about it. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a classic it's uh it's fantastic uh the cast is amazing the humor is amazing uh you know it's just it, and it's one of those movies that honestly really shouldn't work you know because when you try like if you try and explain it to somebody who's who has never seen it it sounds like a horror movie you know it's like you know <laughs> um you know it's just but just everything about it you know uh you know John Candy's cameo, just everything is so good, um, you know, in that movie. So, yeah, that, that's really all I can say is just, you know, it's number four for a reason. And it's just uh, it's really, really good. <laughs> so headed to obviously I agree with everything you said, headed to uh, number number three for me. Kind of be a little controversial here, guys. Ooh, OK, I'm going to go with Home Sweet Home Alone. I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. <laughs> I, I was going to disconnect you right now. No, <laughs> no I just had to get a rise out of y'all because obviously it's the original Home Alone is my number three. Uh-huh. <laughs> I just had to change it up a little bit. No, I mean, what, what can I say that hasn't already been said? You know, it's it's iconic. The musical score. John Williams did the music, right? Yes. Was John Williams? Okay. I John Williams, so. yep. How can it not be John Williams? I mean, it's <laughs> right. strange. You know, it's funny. Sometimes when I hear the Home Alone theme and the Jurassic Park theme, I sometimes as a kid would get them confused because some of the riffs are similar. It's just the signature of John Williams and his stuff. Like occasionally when I'm watching Superman, I hear other like a little bit Indiana Jones in there. It's like, I just, I love how John Williams footprint is like all over his stuff. But anyway, the music, the, the quotes, the the stunts, the premise. It's great for kids to watch and be entertained and feel like they can relate. It's a nightmare for parents to relate to, but it's also still, it absorbs them in. And I think too, just how quotable it is. It gives us one of the best Christmas quotes and Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. <laughs> what, what more can be said, you know? So yeah, Home Alone is my number three for sure. And I, I'm actually very excited to rewatch it because it's been a long time. Yeah. Yes, it, it, it is true. And it's one of those ones too, just like, you know, one thing I love about it as well is that it it, it really personifies so much of the '90s. You know, yes. uh, you know, oh, just absolutely, it's drenched in the '90s, and that's and I love it. Right, but I mean, it's it's written by John Hughes, man. Like, <laughs> I mean, it, made, it, Mr. it makes me scared to use aftershave to this day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, but yeah, I mean, with the music of John Williams and the writing of John Hughes, you've got like the quintessential, like um, perfect Christmas movie. Like, and and I love you you mentioned about the one, one liners, man. And I've always just had this, I don't know, kind of weird fondness for anything that John Hughes has ever touched. Um, you know, we talked about it on the Thanksgiving show and planes, trains and automobiles is absolutely my favorite Thanksgiving movie. Um, you know, going back to breakfast club, 16 candles, um, that's the stuff that I grew up on, man. And so anything that he puts his fingers on is always going to be something that just speaks to my heart of hearts. And this is no different from anything else. I mean, his fingerprints are all over this, just like John Williams's are, um, that's just nice. Good points. uh, I'm going to stop talking about it because I've already mentioned it. It was my number five. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's move on to my number three, which has also already been mentioned. Um, and that is 1954's Michael Curtis, uh, White Christmas. Mm-hmm. And yeah, for man. the same reasons that were mentioned earlier, Bing Crosby singing that song is – quintessential Christmas moment to me. Like as far as just, you can't turn that on and not get goosebumps. You know what I mean? Um, it's just, it's a perfect movie. And I don't say that about very many movies. That is a perfect movie. Um, it's a, as far as musicals go, like, and I love, love, love musicals. Um, it's, it's easily in my top five on musicals as well. Um, yep. Yep. And to have a Christmas movie up there like that is a, a pretty big deal. Um, 
you know, Danny Kaye, Rosemary Clooney. I mean, the, the, the all the music in it, the snow, snow, oh. <laughs> like, just even, <laughs> even silly ones like that mm-hmm. are just like, ah, oh, just love it. Um, but yeah, there's so many great songs, so many, and the, the story of what's going on in that film where they're doing this for their, um, is it a, the captain of mm-hmm. their, of their yes. r- regiment. Yeah. Um, man, it's just a feel good kind of a thing. And I, every, every year I watch it and, and it's also, if you're not a big fan of musicals, it's something that could get you turned on to musicals because it's, it's a musical about musicals, right? Like it's like, um, it's about musicians and they're, they're, they're performing these songs. So it's not like, you know, a typical musical where they'll just break out in a song randomly. No, like it's part of the, part of the movie is they're breaking out in the song, right? Like it's, um, I don't know. I think it's easier for people to get, get used to it. Obviously from what Byron said earlier, that was his, that's actually a really good point, though, that you made that that uh, that sometimes, you know, you see with musicals, they, um, you know, they sacrifice the plot or the narrative, you know, for the numbers. And, you know, White and, you know, White Christmas is very much very plot driven, you know, um, and mm-hmm. the music, though, fits perfectly into that plot. And so I think that's part of the reason, honestly, why why it it has lasted so long is because it's just as good of a story as it is a musical. <laughs> For sure. Yep. All right. Well, going into my my top three here uh, is, uh, um, and, uh, you know, uh, as a preface, I do want to say that my top three are all almost interchangeable. I, I love them all so much. Um, so, but coming in at, at number three is going to be the, you know, the, the Christmas movie of all Christmas movies. And that's, it's a wonderful, wonderful life. Um by uh, Frank Capra from 1946. Um, mm, you know, uh, so good, man. yeah, I don't think you can get any more iconic as a Christmas movie than this. Uh, you know, um, you know, the, the cast is amazing. Uh, the story is amazing. It, it was pretty much one of the first quintessential angel comes down at Christmas time and helps people. Um, you know, uh, you know, there may have been once some on some of those before, I don't know, but this is the first one that I know of, of that, uh, you know, uh, you got, you know, Jimmy Stewart just being, you know, the most Jimmy Stewart that he's ever been. <laughs> you know, and, and I say that, and yeah. I say that in the best way possible. Yes. Um, you know, uh, you know, so and I think cool. oh, it's it just it, it speaks to everybody so much because, you know, he's the every man, you know, mm-hmm. he's not he's not a superhero. He's not, you know. You know, he doesn't get to go off to war with everybody else. You know, he gets left behind, you know, uh, just at some point in everyone's life. I think we all feel like, you know, like George Bailey at some point, mm. um, you know, and, uh, you know, it has a magnificent supporting cast. Uh, you know, it's just incredible. You know, Donna Reed, I think, was my first celebrity crush, I think, um, uh, uh, yeah. you know. And uh, kind of a funny thing I can say is that, you know, growing up, my parents were very strict with what I, what I watched. And so, um, you know, they pretty much only kind of let me watch like golden age of Hollywood type stuff like black and whites. And so I watched like everything that I could get my hands on from blockbuster and Hollywood video. And so I always joke that all of my celebrity crushes, uh, were normally mostly all dead. <laughs> you know, so, um, <laughs> Grace Kelly. Oh, oh my gosh. Grace <laughs> Kelly. Yeah, Elizabeth Taylor. One of my ultimate Elizabeth celebrity Taylor, yeah. crushes. She was one of my from like old movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, it, it's true. So, yeah, you know, um, you know, I, I, I assume we're probably going to be coming back to uh, to It's a Wonderful Life. So I don't want to go on for too long about it because I, I have a feeling you guys will have some thoughts as well. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it doesn't get much better than this movie. <laughs> well, speaking of <laughs> at number two, and you know what? I felt bad. I was like, I'm going to get so much crap for putting this at number two. But Byron put it in number three. So as usual, Byron gets more grief from people than I do. So because <laughs> Byron, you're never controversial at all, right? Not at all. I don't know why people say that. <laughs> you know, it was, if there is a surprise Zack Snyder movie at number one on your list, I'm going to be okay with it. <laughs> because I also love Zack Snyder. But anyways, It's a Wonderful Life is my number two. You know, when I was a kid, this was one I saw several times, bunches of times. And I remember always thinking like, it's a little slow. It's a little boring. 
but then the end is magnificent right like when he goes back uh, or goes to the ultimate reality or whatnot Mm-hmm. and like just held it in esteem for so long just because you should right if you don't you should like what's wrong with you but then i was either in college i think it was in film school we actually re-watched this like in class and i was like man i'm so excited a lot of these kids haven't seen it in the first half of the movie i didn't remember like all the build-up with the great depression everything he goes through everything that leads him to that moment on the bridge and i just remember the like the thematic weight of this and the contemplation of suicide and the themes that it deals with mm-hmm. were so not that they weren't in, explored in film at the time, but they it was a lot more taboo. I feel like from everything I've read and the fact that it had the bravery to do so and to do so with a very strong emphasis on Christian messaging in film at the time is, was just so moving to me. And for the first time I probably ever, I was just like weeping at the end. And like, what a beautiful yeah. redemption story. What a beautiful focus on family and like the important things in life and what to give God glory for. And I just, I could gush about it forever. Mm-hmm. I have a feeling somebody else wants to talk about it too. <laughs> uh, it is 100% like, it probably should be my number one. Um, and what I'm going to put ahead of it, you guys might give me crap for. But oh, It's a Wonderful Life is just wonderful. You know, what's kind of interesting too is that one thing that I, uh, that, uh, that a lot of people uh, don't mention and, and I didn't really even notice it until, you know, like years and years later, you know, cause this was obviously produced during the Hayes code, you know, where, um, you oh, know, yeah. where there was very strict rules yeah. for what you could and couldn't show. Yep. And one thing that I always found very interesting and I'm not a hundred percent sure how Frank Capper got away with it was that, you know, um, kind of like the Hayes code kind of had this rule of that, you know, the villain had to get his comeuppance. He had to somehow, you know, um, like they couldn't get away with their crime. Normally you didn't see that very much with the Hayes code. Right. And, and, you know, Potter gets away with it basically, <laughs> you know, he, he steals the money. He's a complete villain throughout the movie. And he, he, you know, he gets away with his crimes for the most part, you know, um, you know, at the end. And, uh, you know, and I really, really liked how Frank Capra had that almost because, you know, you know, even though we got this kind of fairy tale ending a little bit, it was kind of like, well, Hey, you know what? Sometimes, you know, the bad people in our lives, you know, most oftentimes they get away with, with the stuff they do, you know, um, Mm -hmm. in life. And, uh, you know, I really, I, I, I thought that was very bold of him to have that back, you know, at that point, you know, in film, um, because you didn't see that very often. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that one yet. (laughs) Uh, yeah. So my number two, it's already been mentioned, and and I, I'm really really sad that Curry didn't have this one higher than he did. Um, but I, I, no list is complete without Die Hard. <laughs> I'm not, dude. This film is so stinking good, man. Like, and you know i watch it now as a dad and i watch this one that i watch every year every christmas and and i keep saying one of these years i'm going to watch all five of them <laughs> but <laughs> I, but i never get around to doing it which i've seen the second and third they, one they made I, a fifth one yeah i have yeah, we, really. we don't talk about the fifth one <laughs> I've, I've heard it was terrible but i actually <laughs> it, I own, it is, the stunts huh? in it are really good it is worth it for the stunt work i will yeah. say that I, okay it it is a fantastic action movie it is a terrible Die Hard movie. If that okay. makes any sense, like that makes sense. The fourth one is amazing, by the way. Oh yeah, I love the fourth one. I, <laughs> I, I really like the fourth one when it came out. I saw that one in theaters actually, um, but I never did see the fifth one yet. Um, and then every year I keep saying I'm gonna watch all five of them so I can finally watch the fifth one. And it, something always happens, and I end up just watching the first one like I always do because it's the it's, it's a perfect movie. Why would I want to mess it up? Uh, but but two and three are are both good though. Um, and four as well, but I mean, dude, what can I say about this film that hasn't already been said? Like, it's a man just coming home to see his wife who who left him, moved on the entire um, other side of the country from New York to L.A. and changed her name, and he just wants to, you know, see her for Christmas, and she's kind of moved on with her life, and you know, what's he do? What does a man do? when he's faced with uh, um, his estranged wife who doesn't want to um, 
be married to him anymore. You know what? He still fights for her. And as a matter of fact, he, he fights like legit villains for her in this movie. <laughs> like, like not, not just metaphorically, like he is legitimately fighting for her mm-hmm. uh, and not just her, but you know, everybody in that office building. And it's just like one man with, no shoes on (laughs) takes on this entire uh, group of like super villains. And it's just perfect manly man movie. And of course I'm going to bring up a manly movie, Uh, (laughs) but it just speaks to me as a, as a husband, as a father. And that John McClane is, is always to me going to be one of the quintessential male uh, figures for me to watch in movies and be like, man, that's a dude right there. Like that's hundred oh, <laughs> percent. That's that's the guy I want to be when I grow up <laughs> one of these days. And I still haven't grown up yet, by the way. So, like, yeah. oh. it, it, it is true. It, it is such a good movie. It, it, and, and it's one of those ones, you know, it's such a good, like you said, it's a good movie about manhood. It's a great action movie. It's a great Christmas movie. It just, you know, the acting is great. Just every, every, everyone steals the show in that, you know, uh, Alan Rickman is one of cinema's great villains, you know? Um, Oh yeah. You know, just like, Oh, he's Uh, just so good. You know, (laughs) I love him so much. Oh, you know, I, and I, I, I love, you know, just his his lines about like his suits, you know, it's like, just, Oh, it, 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 it it doesn't get any better than, than that movie. Um, you know, I've been debating this year what I want to watch on on Christmas Eve, uh, you know, and it's like, you know, I, I, I probably am going to end up watching Die Hard. You know, <laughs> it's just, oh, <laughs> nice. man. And you also so, got um, the guy who apparently was a police officer in Chicago, New York and L.A. at different uh, times, uh, <laughs> Reginald Bell Johnson. Uh-huh. Uh, because you know he was a cop in family matters in chicago and he was a cop in ghostbusters in new york so oh that's true kind of interesting he's, he, he's a <laughs> lifelong police officer that just mm-hmm. travels from big city to big city <laughs> wherever there there are fires to be put out um reginald Vell johnson is the guy to do it so uh-huh. <laughs> you didn't know that die hard is actually a prequel to family matters <laughs> exactly <laughs> it actually kind of works <laughs> <laughs> that actually really does kind of work. <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. Oh man. All right. Well, rolling in for my my number two uh, is um, uh, one that uh, you know kind of like it vanished for a long time, uh, and then it's kind of been recently coming back around. I want to say over the last ten years, people have been kind of rediscovering it, uh, and it's from uh, nineteen forty seven, and it's called uh, "It Happened on Fifth Avenue." Uh, Great it is movie. Uh, oh, it's so good it just like it it is it is probably one of the most heartfelt uh christmas movies that i've ever seen like besides it's a wonderful life like it has so, it is just bursting with with cheer and heart um it is so good uh um you know it, it's a difficult movie to explain it's, it's basically about these like two homeless guys um during you know like post world war ii um you know, New York who basically go and, and uh, are squatting in a mansion of like the second richest man in the world. And then like his daughter comes home and is like living with them. And then the, the, the rich guy decides to come and live with them too. It, it When you describe it, it does not make sense at all. It's just one of those movies you have to put on and you have to watch it. Um, but it is, it is, it is so good. Uh, and what's kind of interesting too, is that, you know, really the, the cast, uh, of the film is kind of mostly people who are not really super well known. Uh, you know, Victor Moore, uh, Don DeFore, uh, you know, Charles Ruggles, you know, um, they're all people who you've seen, you know, in, in other films from the golden age. Uh, but most of the times they were in supporting roles, uh, you know, um, and so it was kind of interesting seeing them, you know, at the forefront. But, uh, you know, but if you're looking for, you know, a Christmas movie that's just going to put a smile on your face and is just going to going to restore your faith in humanity, you know, check out It Happened on Fifth Avenue. Nice. Yeah, this I'm, is actually it's actually one of the 
it's actually one of the best Frank Capra movies that Frank Capra didn't actually make. <laughs> I would agree a hundred percent with that. <laughs> Honestly, it really does. It, it feels like a Capra movie and it, it's just because of the, the, um, the optimism in it and the, the family dynamic and, and the, um, just the overall Americana in the film. It's, it, it very much feels like a Frank Capra movie, but it's not. <laughs> you know, so. you know, I, I would actually say it, it is a spiritual sequel to uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Like I would say, you know, um, you know, and it, it fits, you know, when we when we talk about spiritual sequels, you know, with films, I, it happened on Fifth Avenue definitely fits that category. <laughs> For sure. Mm-hmm. And Curry, did you say you haven't seen that one? I have not seen that one. I think it's on uh, it HBO Max. I think, um, and definitely it, it's great. And it's it's one of those ones you can watch there with the whole family. You know, like uh, you know, kids, everybody. There was a there was a time in my life when I was probably like between nine and like thirteen, fourteen years old. My dad loved watching TCM during classic movies, mm-hmm. and I watched movies with yeah. him on there all the times. So at first, it almost made me feel like he was making me and then it became like i would just do it with him and we watched so many movies i don't remember the names of so sometimes people describe movies and i'm like i think i've seen that but i don't know that kind of conflate them all in my head for me Uh (laughs) that could be one of them i'm not sure when you were describing it i was like wait a second i don't know so i don't feel like i can count it But uh, we are at the big old number one, aren't we? We are. Mm-hmm. All we right. reached the well, top of the of, of the Christmas mountain. <laughs> I'm actually surprisingly, this one has been mentioned, um, but I can always count on Byron to know uh, my taste because we have very similar tastes and things uh-huh. <laughs> most of the time. And uh, that is <laughs> Jingle All the Way. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Dude, I, JB knows this. I am a huge Schwarzenegger guy. Like, love Schwarzenegger. Stallone equally, maybe Stallone a little bit more. I could go either way. It depends on the day. But Schwarzenegger did a hilarious slapstick comedy of a Christmas film that is also basically an action movie as a Christmas film. But is also, and this this is where the film doesn't get as much credit as it should, it is a wonderful satire of the Christmas season and the commercialization of Christmas and how it makes people lose focus of what the season is truly about. And a lot of people don't think about mm. that, but it's also a spoof of Power Rangers and how those big children's shows and, and the cry for toys and, you know, turbo man and all that. So like, if you, this is one of those movies. Nobody, loves, called, boomer. <laughs> nobody loves boomer. Yeah. But nobody, nobody loves the alpha. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it, it, just like home alone, sometimes even more so than home alone. I feel like this movie is so quintessential nineties. It, it captures so much about what kids were into in the, into the nineties, how films were in the nineties how black friday shopping and uh you know just the shopping at christmas how it started to get so corporate to where people would trample each other like that happens in this movie and it's played for laughs and then like arnold schwarzenegger almost assaults a little kid trying to get that <laughs> well he basically does assault a little kid which that never bothered me until i became a dad and uh-huh. like, that's my kid i would beat his tail with my wife's purse too yeah. but uh you know and also we, we've talked about this a bunch tonight but how when films are quotable and just like that, those memorable lines of dialogue, I can quote this movie like all day and night. One of my favorite ones is uh, when he says, he got to. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so, it's so funny. And like when he's uh, recounting all the, uh, all the reindeer and he's like, Donna Blitzen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like his, in his chemistry, like his comedic chemistry with Sinbad on screen. There's, there's a great cast. I mean, this one of Jake Lloyd's only other roles. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rita Wilson plays his wife. Um, it's one of the earliest movies that I can think of that has a post credit scene, um, which I think is one of the best post credit scenes out there. It's absolutely hilarious. Uh, if you haven't seen the post credit scene, you should definitely watch it on YouTube. Um, it, there's just so much going for it. It's got really well-directed action sequences, which is so strange to say for a Christmas film. Uh, but Arnold Schwarzenegger was at the top of his game here. Uh, I could literally rave about it um, all day and night. 
Um, so I will just end with a quote because I love doing an Arnold voice and that will be put that cookie down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh I, I'm so I'm so glad that you you included that as as your first because it is such it is such it a so good much. movie. I oh, love it. you know it just you know like you said it it did so much first you know that we see so commonly you know in Christmas movies now but it it, it did it first um, mm-hmm. you know and the satire of everything just like you know this I love how the movie is one long fetch quest basically <laughs> yeah. um, you know. <laughs> You know, and you know, he has to go, you know, to the like, you know, the the underground like mafia Santas, you know. Like, and then you know. he gets in a fight with a reindeer and drinks a beer with him after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, it just, yeah. it, 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 I, I just, I love it. it. Dials the ridiculousness up to like fifteen, and it's just all, and and it's all the better for it in every and way. Also, that core, that and JB. I don't, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I'm sure you have, but it's got that core like father son relationship with them, which I'm kind of a sucker for, especially now. Um, yeah. And it really has something to say about that and like absent fathers and like that whole commercialization, putting your job first. There's a lot of worthwhile themes in jingle all the way that don't get the credit they deserve. Mm-hmm. So I will advocate for this movie till the end of time. <laughs> well, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to let y'all have that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I, I, don't kick me off the show um <laughs> oh i just saw your letterbox score boo i i here's the thing wow. you guys are making some points that makes me want to watch it again but i had not watched it since i was a kid and i remember really really loving it and thinking it was one of the greatest christmas movies ever and then last year i watched it for the first time in probably 20 something years and i was like Oh my gosh, it's so dumb. <laughs> um, it just did not. I, I remember watching it and thinking, I wish I would have left that in my childhood. <laughs> left, that, <laughs> left that good memory that I had of that movie in my childhood. Um, but now that you, I listen to you guys, you know, falling all over it, I'm going to have to give it another shot. Uh, Even if it's not your five star masterpiece that it is for me, you know, I, I do yeah. think maybe you could uh, take another look. Otherwise, yeah. you can just be in your wrong and be wrong about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in your wrongness and be wrong. Yeah, it is kind of interesting looking at like the letterbox scores for like you know uh, you know uh, my friends and like a lot of our mutual friends. It's mm-hmm. very interesting seeing like most people are scoring it either like four and five stars or two stars. It's very interesting. Yeah, it's so uh-huh. weird. yeah, it's like seems like it. It's very much a pendulum with people. So that that's very interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, I guess it's no secret what my number one is. Um, I think most people who know anything about me and and my opinions on films is um, this movie is always near and dear to my heart. It's not only my favorite Christmas movie; it is my all-time number one favorite movie ever made. It's a wonderful life. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with Capra. I just, I love his writing and his directing. And I just, when I sit down and watch a movie, I don't want to sit and watch something that's going to depress the crap out of me. Like a, I don't know, uh, a Terrence Malick movie or something <laughs> like um, where James Hamrick sat up in bed, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, there somewhere he's like, dude, Hamrick, I, I can't, I can't with Hamrick, man. He, everything he wants to watch is like, why? It's just, uh. <laughs> I, 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 some credit. He's in that pretentious film school like stage where you know it's it's uh, it's Terrence Malick or, or bust. <laughs> He's in he's in the cage stage right now. <laughs> the cage stage. The cage movie. stage. Yeah. Nice, yeah. nice. I love it. Yeah. Now I I, I never thought of uh, the film school cage stage, but that definitely fits. fits it's uh, definitely Hammer, a so. thing too. Totally. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't say anything about this film that hasn't already been said. But like, it's just there's so much in it. I love. As I was saying earlier, when I sit down, especially at Christmas time, I want to watch something that's going to uplift me 
and something that's going to have some heavy family themes and friendship themes. And like, I, I just, I love optimism in movies. You know, if I wanted to watch something depressing, I would just turn it on the freaking news. Right. So <laughs> this movie, it just speaks to it. Like you said, George Bailey is the every man. He is the guy who had a, who had a bad ear. So he had to stay home. He couldn't join the military. Even when they had the draft, he was, he was, he was, whatever it's called for F um, he had to stay home and, and fight the fight, the fight, the battle of Bedford falls that they said. And his brother went off to be a war hero. Uh, his friends went off or his brother and or his brother and his friends went, went off to be a football star in college. He didn't get to go to college because he had to stay home and take care of his dad's business and everything he wanted to do in life. He wanted to build things. He wanted to do something important and not be cooped up in this shabby little office <sighs> to, for him to want something more than what he has, something different than what he has. And that's, I think everybody goes through that in life and, and think that they might be a failure because they don't have this, that, and the other, but you know, what he has done in his life, the reason he can't hear out of one of his ears is because he saved his brother's life when he was 12 years old. And the reason that he couldn't go off to college or go off to, um, to Europe like he wanted to do is because his dad died and he had to take care of his business. Like everything he did was for other people. He never thought of himself at all, even though he was always saying, I want to do this. I want to do that. But when push came to shove, when he had to make a decision, he was always doing something for someone else. And man, we, the world needs more George Bailey's. <laughs> like, Oh my gosh. And in that scene where they start bringing the money at the end and like everybody comes in, starts pitching in. And when the maid says, I was saving this for a divorce when, if ever I got a husband, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was just, it's so perfect. Um, and, and, and it's all capped off with, you know, his brother raising a toast to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. Mm. I seriously like completely belligerently ugly cry when, when that happens <laughs> every single year. And I watch it every year, sometimes twice. It, I, I I lose my crap when I watch the movie. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I love it. You know, it, I I love your uh, I love your your case for it. You know, because it's it, it, you're absolutely right about everything. You know, um, there there is a reason that it is the number one Christmas movie. You know, like of all time. You know, and it's it earns it earns that ranking. Honestly, uh, I think. Um, is just absolutely spectacular. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, coming around to my, my number one here, uh, you know, uh, this is one that, uh, um, I don't believe has been mentioned yet. Um, and, uh, uh it is my number one, uh, Christmas film. Uh, and that is, uh, 1945's Christmas in Connecticut. Um, I was wondering if somebody would mention that one. Oh yeah. I, I love this movie. Honestly, I had I had never heard of it uh, before. Um, I was probably about man, I can't remember how old I was um, that I randomly stumbled upon it in Hollywood Video, uh, an old VHS copy of it, and um, and it was you know Christmas time, so you know uh, my parents and I we picked it up and just like I fell in love with it. Uh, you know, it stars you know uh, Barbara Stanwyck, Dennis Morgan. Uh, Sydney Greenstreet in a very rare non-villainous role. Um, you know, um, you know, a lot of people who watch noirs will always recognize him. You know, he he starred alongside Humphrey Bogart. You know, as the villain in in uh, quite a few movies. Um, but uh, you know, the basic storyline of it is, you know, Barbara Stanwyck is this like uh, writer for a magazine. You know, where she writes like uh, recipes and like this, you know, this idyllic life in the country she has. But the secret she has is that she doesn't actually have that life. <laughs> that she's like living in an apartment, and then she ends up through a series of mishaps, having to host a wounded soldier from World War II at her house uh, in the country. 
and her editor and everything ends up like they have to put together this plan because she doesn't want to be fired. And so she has to create this whole like fake life, basically, uh, you know, to uh, uh, for the soldier and her editor and everything. And of course, there's like a romance plot and everything. And it's just it's such a great it's such a great movie um, has a fantastic cast. Um, you know, the humor, it has slapstick humor. It has witty banter. Um, you know, it has kind of that, uh, that um, 1940s, you know, like Christmas feel that you saw in like holiday Inn and everything like that, that just, um, yeah, it's, it's just fantastic. So if any of you have not seen Christmas in Connecticut, uh, check it out. I want to say, I think it's streaming on HBO max right now. And uh, it's just, it's just, uh, it's a pleasure to watch at Christmas time. Cool deal, man. I, I think I've seen that one. Mm-hmm. Um, it was one of those ones I think I watched with my dad, mm-hmm. but I've like, I couldn't tell you any details, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I've seen it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's one of those ones. Like I, I, I think it was on pretty, it, it's normally on a pretty heavy rotation of Turner movie classics, uh, you know? Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's so good. Um Absolutely. You know, but man, well, you know, we have reached the end of our, our top 10 list. Uh, you know, we've had a few overlapping films. We've had some that, uh, that on lists that, um, you know, the others haven't had. And I also want to congratulate, uh, you know, all three of us on, uh, being marked safe from love actually. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, I actually am not, uh, you know, uh, it's not a movie that I dislike, um, but it's also one that I don't quite understand, you know, being at the top of everybody's lists, Um, you know, so, uh, so actually I'm kind of happy to (laughs) to have gotten through a list where actually we did not mention that movie once. Um, (laughs) Well, it's, it's one that I've, I've always wanted to watch and I I just haven't gotten around to doing it because I really love Richard Curtis's um, About Time. Mm, I actually, I actually did a a mainly movies episode on that because Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, Oh, that movie's so freaking good. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've always wanted to watch love actually thinking he, he, maybe he captures some kind of magic in it. Like, like that other movie that, that I liked of his. So we'll see. You know, I mean, I I would say it's definitely, it's worth watching. You know, like I said, I don't dislike it. Um, you know, it's just not up, you know, as high up on, on lists as like the other movies. But, you know, if if you enjoy kind of the classic Hollywood star driven vehicle, it's oh, man. I mean, it's just packed full of 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 stars. You know, Um, it it is definitely it is definitely good. Um, You know, it's definitely I would say it's not like a not really a family friendly movie. Um, You know, it's not really something you can, you know, watch with like the whole family because there is definitely some some uh, some scenes in it. But uh, but it's worth watching. So I I think you'll probably enjoy it, Um, you know. Definitely worth seeing at least once to see how you feel about it. Nice. All right. So we are at that time, folks, now for uh, our each of our picks for what we feel is the worst Christmas movie. Um, you know, um, and this is a movie that doesn't have to be worst in the sense of of filmmaking. It can just be one that you dislike for some reason. Um you know, so uh, why don't we get started with you, JB? Uh, what, what is the movie that you hate the most at Christmas time? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say what y'all what we talked about earlier. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not gonna say that because it's not. It's not definitely not the worst. Um, and I understand why people really like it. Um, I I could say the Santa Claus Three, but it's been a long time since I've watched it, so um, I just remember it being pretty bad. Um, same with, um, Christmas with the cranks. I, I remember not liking yeah. it either, mm-hmm. but I, I did read the John Grisham, uh, book, the original that that was based off skipping Christmas. And I really liked it, but yeah, I just remember that movie being kind of dumb. Um, I'd like to say a Christmas story just because it's overrated. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm I'm coming to the the one that I have that 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 I have to mention that I just want to be controversial on this because <laughs> I know how much people love this movie and they consider it one of their you know offbeat Christmas movies that pe- pretentious people a lot of times will probably say this is a good one or I'd say maybe people that you know don't get caught up in the traditional Christmas movies and want to be different 
Uh, but dude, I've never understood why people like Krampus so much. Like, <laughs> I've never seen it. I, I want to because I, I like oh, the, I like the director a lot. Um, I like what he did with Godzilla, but I, yeah, I, Christmas and horror. Are, yeah, I don't know. You know. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. Christmas and horror just don't mix for me. And this movie, I don't know. It just it just kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> like I'm just <laughs> I'm not. I, I, I first of all, I don't really like cult kind of movies, and I'm not talking about like 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 a cult classic for anything. I'm talking about like legit movies that are like about pagan cultic practices and stuff mm. and i just i i don't know i just can't do i don't like the wicker man and stuff like that and midsommar i just it's i don't I, I can't deal with it it just it makes my stomach churn and it hurts to watch it um and this is just one of those it's kind of like that and i'm just it, it ain't for me and i don't understand why so so many people like it <laughs> I remember there being a snowman movie where the snowman kills people. Yes. <laughs> From the, I think it came out in the nineties. I don't remember what it's called. I need I to rewatch that, but I, I know what you're talking about. I, I haven't I ever seen it. Mean, I, remember, yeah. I remember seeing the, like the VHS at Blockbuster and Hollywood video, like you mentioned Byron. I remember seeing it at those places quite a bit and I always wanted to watch it, but I'm like, I was too scared. <laughs> <laughs> It is a uh, Jack Frost from 1997. <laughs> okay, it is Jack Frost. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm thinking that was a good movie though. I was thinking that. Well, well there's a Mike. Isn't there one with Michael Keaton that's the same title? Uh, I believe so. Yes. I think um, those movies people get confused. It's like mm-hmm. a okay. strange Mandela effect kind of thing. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. Jack Frost the uh, with um with him with Michael Keaton. Yeah, yeah, because that one's much more of like the heartfelt, like you know, father son type movie. Uh, yeah, which is that's a good movie too. I, mm-hmm. I have seen that one. Um, but yeah. Mm-hmm. So I is it you want me to go next, Byron? Yeah, why don't you go next and let us know <laughs> what your least favorite is? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and talk about a couple. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, JB I mean, got his cheat, uh, so I'm gonna get mine. Uh, I just mentioned like four movies, so go go ahead. <laughs> uh, Home Alone three and four. Oh gosh, I remember as a kid, I'd really tried to like Home Alone three, and I think of the sequels, it's probably the the better one. But when Home Alone four came out, that's when I because I did watch it. I remember being like, "That's not Kevin McAllister, <laughs> <laughs> not my Kevin McAllister," and like just the fact that Macaulay Culkin wasn't in them, and I feel like if he had been, it would have been a totally different story and they just kind of rehash everything. And I think they made even more sequels after that. And I just like, they feel like quintessential cash grabs by Hollywood to milk something to death. And they just completely lose that magic from the first two. And that, that this is me speaking from watching them as a kid. Like it has stuck with me for that long, but I I wouldn't say I hate them. I just don't care for them. But <laughs> this is one I haven't seen, but I already know I would hate it. And I'm never going to watch it because I hate that it even exists. And that is Jingle All the Way 2. Mm-hmm. Why in the world would you make a sequel to an Arnold Schwarzenegger film starring Larry the Cable Guy? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> like, dude, what the heck? And they have the audacity to call it Jingle All the Way 2, not some weird subtitle where it's like, oh, straight to DVD, which it was. I, 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 anything I've ever seen about anything, you know, Larry the Cable Guy can be funny in small doses to me, but to lead that as the sequel to my favorite Christmas film, I just can't stand <laughs> that uh, concept on paper. And I'm actually really hoping nobody's ever talked about it, but I would love to see Schwarzenegger do a legacy sequel to Jingle All the Way it, because they have the perfect setup. Like, do it to where he's like trying to find a PlayStation Five with his grandson. <laughs> like, Jake Lloyd would never come back, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But um, if they, if they could, that'd be amazing. He won't. But like like he's they can make it a play on like they could do the the play box seven or something like combine. You know they can make something up and he's trying to find it for his grandkids and he can't do it and he has to try to navigate like online like Amazon shopping. Like there's there's so many good ideas that they could do with that. And they made a sequel with Larry the Cable Guy. I'm, 
I'm honestly surprised that they have not because like Schwarzenegger has been revisiting, you know, some of his hits. And like, even though that movie was not a hit in theaters, it it is really it's become a hit over the years. You know, like, every, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. Like, I would love to see that. Oh, like people literally made memes when the PS5 first came out. Mm -hmm. They're like, this is today's Turbo Man. I'm like, (laughs) there's your plot right there. Like, let's (laughs) what Mm -hmm. the heck? If nobody else writes it, maybe I should. Oh, Dude, I, I, I would read that script if you uh, if you wrote that. <laughs> yeah, I just might. Oh, I, I actually I'll be honest, have. I'm... Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I'll be honest. I'm You're making me want to put Jingle All the Way 2 on right now. <laughs> 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 just to spite you and try it out. <laughs> you probably would like it more than the original, you heretic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'll, I'll be honest. I have a soft spot for, for Larry the Cable Guy because. I get that. Um, here's the thing this is what i love about larry the cable guy he is um because i've watched some of his original comedy before he was larry the cable guy when he was uh whatever his name is ron williams or something i can't think of his his real name um um but he was you know up there in khakis and sneakers and he doesn't have a southern accent at all um and then he just came up with this persona Larry the Cable Guy, and he was instantly a success overnight. And people go to his shows. Southerners go to this guy's shows and laugh hysterically at a man who is making fun of them. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just so perfect. And they don't, most of them probably don't realize that he's making fun of them. This is a character. Uh, it's just so funny. So funny. I I did not know that he didn't have a southern accent. That's that's really interesting. It's kind of yeah. wild to think about. He's like seriously one of the most biggest comedic geniuses out there to just come up with a persona like that. And basically, your target audience that loves you the most are the people that you're making fun of. <laughs> that is pretty genius. That uh, is really funny. Yeah, doesn't belong to jingle all the way too, but that is genius. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I uh, I actually have um uh, I actually got at Walmart uh, when they came out with it. I think it was last year. Um, the uh, the Turbo Man action figure. I have I have that. Uh, oh, I'm so jealous. It's so cool. Oh, I still have it in the box and everything. Um, but it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing, man. All right. Well, my my I have a uh, I I have two here that uh that I really dislike when it comes to it. Um, I'll give the honorable mention first, and then I'll give the one that I, I really dislike the most. Um, and uh, the uh, the first one that is is one that I absolutely hate was one that I saw last year. Um, and uh, it was called a Firehouse Christmas, and it was one of those like Hallmark type movies. Um, but it wasn't a Hallmark movie though. It was like a Hallmark ripoff, like almost one of those like lifetime ones that you see or something. Um, and it is, it is one of the worst Christmas movies I've ever seen. It is terrible in every sense of the word. It's like about a firefighter, um, who like is trying to, you know, get back with his like ex-wife or something. It is just, it is just terrible. And it's like, you know, because it goes from being kind of like a ro- like a romantic comedy to being this kind of like slapstick humor thing. It's oh my gosh, it's just awful. So like, um, so that that's my honorable mention. Um, but the choice that I'm going to give for my most disliked one, it's probably going to be a little controversial. Um, I wanted to throw a little bit of controversy in there, but it is one that I dislike, and that is 2004's The Polar Express with Tom Hanks. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, oh. I, I mean, to make it worse, I've never seen it. Oh, I appreciate oh, what Robert Zemeckis was trying to do, and I it it was a a uh, very ambitious you know movie for it's for the time that it was made. So I really do appreciate it. Um, but it is it is it is awful. It is it it's. I w- I'm going to just say it, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's like <laughs> all of the CGI characters played by Tom Hanks and everybody. It is like uncanny Valley. They have no souls looking out of their eyes, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> it, it, when you were going along in this adventure on the train, I just kept thinking like I am in a horror movie right now. 
<laughs> and then all the characters seem like they're made of rubber, you know, as they're like, they're like bending and, you know, jumping around. It's like, it's, it, it, it's like Gumby from hell, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, so that is, that is my, my pick for the worst Christmas movie. Um, and, uh, you know, so yeah, it, it's just, in my opinion, like I said, I appreciate what he was trying to do with it, but nothing about it worked. <laughs> the children's book is better anyway. That's why I never watched the movie because oh, mm-hmm. the children's book is really good. Hey, oh. uh, can I, can I cheat and mention two more honorable mentions that I love? So we end on a positive note. Yeah, go for it. Uh-huh. <laughs> because and now I'm sitting here like, because I could not remember all these Christmas movies. And now you guys have got me thinking about all these. The two I just wanted to mention is Ernest Saves Christmas. If you guys have never watched the Ernest movies, have you ever seen them? Any of them? I, I've seen a couple of them. I have not seen a, I have not seen the Christmas one though. <laughs> they are for uh, lack of a better pun. So earnest <laughs> in their portrayal. <laughs> uh, they, they are just like heartwarming slapstick, stupid kitty fun. And the Christmas one is, is is like just one of the better ones and the, the halloween one Ernest scared stupid is the best but very very fun movies your kids would probably love them uh, jb um and then i am a huge drake and josh fan uh, it's one of my favorite sitcoms i grew up on it uh but the finale to like the whole thing was merry christmas drake and josh and it's it's like a tv movie and once you get past the very very silly premise that they have they're ordered by a court to give these like uh foster children the best christmas ever or they go to jail like, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense and it's absolutely ridiculous but i love drake and josh so much and is hilarious and uh it, it also worked as like a series finale so it, it is a special place in my heart i just wanted to mention those because i did not think of them earlier oh, you know yeah, I've, I've, I've only ever seen a little bit of drake and josh that makes so... me want to go and check it out now <laughs> It's so funny. Unfortunately, not all the episodes are streaming because of music like licensing issues mm-hmm. with streaming. They they didn't buy like streaming rights, um, and mm-hmm. they've never fully released it on home video. So, oh man, that's yeah, a shame. It's it's a few in the first two seasons, and I think one in the last season. Uh, but anyway, it's literally like one of my all time favorite shows. It is a clean, like hilarious comedy show that you can watch with your kids. Um, some people might think it's dumb, but it works for me. Yeah. And I actually, I remember really liking the Ernest movies too. When I was a kid, I, I, I needed to bring those, let, let my kids watch them. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I had I actually, since you did it, I've got two that I wanted to mention as well. Uh, this is actually, I've never seen it, but as, as we were talking and I was kind of searching some of the stuff that we talked about, um, uh, Curry, you will appreciate this by, and Byron too. Um, there was actually a remake of Christmas in Connecticut from 1992 and it has Chris Christopherson and Tony Curtis and it is directed by Arnold Schwarzenegger. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> no freaking way. Yeah. Apparently it's his only directing credit too. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, oh, that is I'm watching wild. that. Okay, I want to go and I want to see that now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Oh, uh, but and, and now one that I, yeah, right, nineteen ninety two. Now one that I have seen that I did not even think about it being a Christmas movie, but I've got to mention it because it's to me it's a top three uh, Judy Garland movie is uh, Meet Me in St. Louis. Hmm. Uh, if you haven't seen that one, if you like musicals, if you like Judy Garland. Dude, you've got this is like one of her best movies ever, and and it's just such a, mm, yeah, it's a good uh, one. That's all I'm gonna say. Nice, yeah, I'm familiar with that one, but I don't, it's it's in that category of maybe I've seen it. I don't remember. <laughs> Man, well, you guys, you guys got me into 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 this uh, extra honorable mention thing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give one more to uh, <laughs> that's a Christmas one. And you know, and this is this is going back to the golden age of, of Hollywood. I keep going back because they made so many good movies back then. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, this was uh, from 1949, and uh, it was uh, called "Come to the Stable" with Loretta Young. And um, it's one of those ones that you don't really hear a lot about. It's one of my mom's favorite movies. Uh, you know, she's seen it countless times, and um, it's it's basically about these two nuns who um, arrive unannounced in the uh, New England town of Bethlehem. And they basically are going with like 
no support and no money in order to build a children's hospital. Um, and it's the story, basically it's set, you know, there it's set, you know, at Christmas time and everything. And it's, and it's about basically their journey of trying to raise the money in order to build this children's hospital. And it's, it's a comedy, uh, but it's also like a heartfelt drama as well. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a great, great movie. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, has a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, Christian themes. I mean, obviously, you know, they're, they're Catholic nuns in it. Um, but, uh, but it has a lot of, uh, a lot of very, uh, very sweet themes of, of, you know, of like, you know, hope of prayer of miracles, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, um, you know, the gospel it's, it's, it's a great, great movie. So I highly recommend, uh, to anybody, if you, if you enjoy Christmas movies and if you enjoy that, that era, it's, it's one to, uh, to check out. Cool, man. Mm -hmm. Definitely keep in mind. Mm -hmm. yep. Man. Well, you know, uh, I want to thank you guys for, uh, for coming on, uh, for this, uh, for this special Christmas themed episode, uh, had a lot of fun. And I think, uh, I think we discussed a lot of great movies and there's some on there that I'd never heard of. And those ones that I hadn't seen, you know, that I've marked down on my list, uh, you know, so, uh, definitely appreciate you guys, you guys coming on. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's, it's been a pleasure. It's it's late here. Mm -hmm. I stayed longer than I said I would. But that's just a testament to enjoying speaking to both of you very, very much. Um, I had a great time. It was a, actually a recharge I didn't know I needed. So Aww. Merry Christmas to you both. I appreciate your friendships very much. Oh, man. Well, Merry Christmas to you, Curry, yeah, and to you, JB, as well. Um, you know, I love being friends with you guys. And, uh, you know, you guys have enriched my life in a lot of, in a lot of uh, various ways, you know. And, um, you know, where can, uh, where can people uh, follow you guys and see the content that you're producing? <laughs> JBL, you go first. Okay, yeah. Well, um, I have a podcast called Manly Movies, where I I've had Curry on there a couple times, which his episodes have not been released yet, but they're coming. Um, and I've and Byron's on been on there, hmm, well, three times as well. One of one of which has not been released, um, but but it's also coming soon. Um, but yeah, I basically we just talk about we, we take a movie that you know, speaks to men and we just kind of talk about the different lessons that you can take as a man, as a husband, father, or really just all men in general. Um, and, and we look and try to find the, the positive and, and, the, uh, and what, what can we learn from movies and, you know, what, what can they teach us about life and, and about being a man? And that's kind of where, where, where I come from. Um, you know, search manly movies in your, uh, favorite podcast catcher i also have letterbox i think my name is something <laughs> i think it's i think it's just uh jb huffman maybe i'm not sure i'll i'll come back to that later you can go on to curry it is I actually had your letterbox up because i was on that torch and anchor movie it, it is just jb huffman yeah <clears throat> yeah so for me uh gosh I feel like I do a lot and thread myself thin. <laughs> but, uh, you, uh, firstly, a little shameless plug for Byron. I uh, occasionally uh, write for viralhair.com uh, movie reviews, otherwise known as the Curry Review. Um, I'm branding it after myself uh, because it's just funny. Uh, and actually, there's a whole story behind that. Uh, it comes from a dance that was named the Curry that I did at a church youth group one time. Um, that just is actually at the front of all of my videos. <laughs> uh, it, it was dubbed the curry, but that's where that comes from. Um, if you didn't know, uh, it is going to be trademarked here shortly. Probably. <laughs> um, so I do that. Uh, I have a YouTube channel with a good friend of mine uh, who I think has been on JB's podcast, mainly movies, uh, Lamont English. He and I have a YouTube channel called Nerd City Central, where it sounds like what it is it's mm -hmm. uh we, we rank movies uh, franchises we sometimes do theories we're a little bit uh sparsed out with how we do our content just both being dads and busy and being in different time zones um, we recently ranked the spider-man uh series that's coming out uh soon um and so we're, we're aiming to do like one video a month uh for next year to just try to be more consistent but the main crux of what i do uh for the curry review is on my youtube channel which is <laughs> it's always funny when how, how I try to explain this to people. My YouTube channel is Curinator Productions, 
And one of my shows on my channel is the Curry Review. I've had that channel since 2008 and I have done all, all sorts of stuff on it. Um, and yeah, so I just, I like to review things that I like, things that I'm into. I don't review every new release. Um, I'm, my, my goal is to join some critics associations and um, uh, actually uh, Byron uh, approved me to be in one has been a big uh, mentor for me in that area with the indie critics of America. So thank you for that, Byron. You rock. Oh, and, you're uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. means, means a lot to me. It was a big deal when I got to share that. Um, and our motto at the Curry Review is always look for the good. So what I try to do is even with movies I can't stand, which I probably need to do for Jingle All the Way to and actually watch it, <laughs> <laughs> is, is to always look for the good. What, what what can we pull out that is fair, that people that worked hard on this film, the thousands that didn't have anything to do with the story or the bad decisions in marketing or whatnot, let's pull the good out of that and be very honest and kind of review something from a more uh, – relatable headspace for the average moviegoer and less so uh the the terrence malick fans uh you know, <laughs> but well, but more like, but also trying to engage in a way where it's like oh there's there's some knowledge of the deeper things of film theory and all that here too so it's what i aim for so you can follow me or uh, subscribe at coordinator productions on youtube and you know i really like that theme because it kind of fits with with my philosophy on film is you know, what I always say is um, not, I, I always say not all five stars are created equal. Um, and what phrase. I mean by that, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I mean by that is if, if a director, the filmmakers make something that, you know, fully fleshes out their intention and I can tell that. And, you know, it came across to me as what they were seeking out to do. It's a five star film. You know, like that's why I can say in a with a straight face that Casablanca and Anchorman are both five star films. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, uh, you mentioned the the um, the association that that Byron kind of put together, and uh, I'm a part of that too, and I appreciate Byron for putting that together. And I'm sorry that I didn't mention that or or, or the. Um, the viral hair gig that you hooked me up with, but I would have mentioned it if I wasn't so lazy and not, you know, if I haven't written a review in like forever. Uh, and I think I've only written like three. <laughs> so, I I'm have just, like a whole collection on letterbox. I, I, I review everything I watch on letterbox now. And even if it's just like a sentence and my goal with that is to be like, Oh, if I need to like throw up a viral hair article, or if I need to do a YouTube short when I don't have time to do like a full on production, I can just do it that way. So anyway, no, that's, that's absolutely true. And yeah, for, for all of you guys who are, who are listening, yeah. Um, and if you're a critic out there, you know, check out the, uh, the website, uh, indie critics of America.org. Um, you know, we're a, we're a new organization. We just started uh, this year in 2022 and it's dedicated to, uh, independent film critics, uh, in America and Canada. Um, and, uh, um, we're growing quite rapidly and, uh, of course, JB and Curry are, are members. Um, and, uh, so yeah, def definitely check it out. There's a lot of, a uh, lot of great critics on there. We have links to all of their work. Um, so, you know, go and check them out and, you know, you might, uh, might some, find some new people to follow. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, feel free to, uh, like share and subscribe to under the lens, uh, the podcast you're listening to right now. It's available on, uh, every major podcast platform. And uh, if you want to find more uh, of uh, my work, um, uh, I write on uh, viralhair.com uh, and as well as um, the uh, 25 uh, YL media site, 25 years later.com. Uh, I post um, longer film uh, essays and analysis on there. Um, and of course, you can uh, always follow me on uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Vero True Social. So. Um, thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. I hope you, uh, you enjoyed it as much as I did and, uh, you know, uh, tell your friends and, uh, share this episode for anybody, uh, who you think enjoys Christmas movies and, uh, to all of you, I hope you have a Merry Christmas and a very happy holidays. Merry Christmas. You filthy animals. Oh, he stole it from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a <the> perfect ending. <laughs>